Welcome to On My Way to Wealth, the podcast where busy Gen Xers can learn financial tips as they navigate life on their way to wealth. And now, please join your host, Luis Rosa. This episode is brought to you by Latin Excellence. Visit latinexcellence.com. That's latinx, C-E-L-L-E-N-C-E.com or latinxmovement.com to learn more and shop our merchandise. You are excellence. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of On My Way to Wealth, Women's History Month edition. My name is Luis Rosa, and I am your host. Today, I have a very special guest. She is a globally recognized storyteller and author of brand storytelling. She's a creative journalist and content strategist, evangelizing brand narrative, and showcasing how thought leaders can leverage storytelling techniques for culture activation and influence in the digital age. She has earned several awards in digital marketing and customer experience and is ranked as top in-demand speaker at leading industry conferences around the world. She brings over 15 years of expertise, valuable industry and consulting insights, matched with a lighthearted and connected delivery approach. Her social advocacy and philanthropic work include volunteering to train social enterprise leaders in Africa, coaching students at Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship in the U.S., and mentoring men and women to build their personal brand with empathy, passion, and purpose. However, her biggest accomplishment to date is being a mother of two boys and an American bulldog. She has a superpower. She can run in heels, and her superfood is ice cream. And without further ado, Miri Rodriguez. Welcome, Miri. Thank you, Luis. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for taking out the time from your busy schedule. I know you just came back from a a trip in Aruba. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> things you got to do, not too shabby, not too shabby. It was, uh, I was there for actually for a women's conference, which was uh, really empowering and uh, very inspiring. So oh, I never awesome. complained. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It was really nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, uh, I saw some pictures on Instagram. And as always, you, you have all these inspiring messages. So I love how you find the opportunity to always just bring in the value there, you know, Um so I wanted to have you this month because, you know, I've been following you on Instagram for a bit and I, I appreciate how you're always like putting yourself out there and mm-hmm. using some of your own struggles and what you call failures to just inspire others to do better. So yeah. thank you for that. You know, so yeah. just want to let you know you're, you're definitely reaching people, including myself. Thank so thank you. you. Um, before we get into our conversation, I want to ask you just about your background in general, if you can tell us yeah. your upbringing. Absolutely. So I was born in Venezuela to parents uh, that were missionaries. So we actually traveled. My I had a beautiful childhood in Venezuela. I did, my parents traveled all around, took us all around by car. Um, we worked for a local church donating things. Uh, it was ironic because we didn't have things. You know, we just kind of passed <laughs> along. People donated to us and we donated to people. Um, but that really instilled values in us uh, around loving people and giving. So those core values stuck with me, um, you know, through my adulthood. And eventually we went our our way here. My parents got invited uh, through the organization that hosted us to come to the States and, uh, and to stay here and do some of the missions here. So that's how we ended up here way before, you know, the political unrest in Venezuela had happened. So I remember my country as a rich, beautiful, uh, just vibrant country. I I don't recognize what it is today, but uh, a beautiful childhood nevertheless. And you know, came to Miami and um, made our way here as immigrants, no English, no friends, uh, no family. Um, So it was tough. It was a tough adolescence, you know, being 13. Um, And um, just like anybody else, just trying to figure out who I was right at that time. And uh, eventually my parents, obviously, we didn't have the means. My parents basically said, if you want to go to school, you got to you know, work and you got to get your scholarships. Um, I have two sisters. So the three of us did, we got scholarships and paid our way through school. So yeah. (laughs) That's amazing. And you know, as you were telling me that it it just gave me a little flashback about myself. I came from Dominican Republic Okay. at age 11, so similar age. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly. Yeah. It's a hard age because I had to leave all my friends behind. I know come to the U S learn a new, a new language, Language. right? New school, new friends. I mean, it was, it was a big, Culture it's shock a big deal. <laughs> at that age, at that age, I think it's just it's harder because you're doing, you know, you're everything is big. You know, everything is like I, I can't, I don't, I can't make friends. I can't speak English, and you know, it, everything is like it's so big. So I, I hear that. I love Dominican Republic, by the way. It's a beautiful country with beautiful people. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I've never been to Venezuela, but um, I hear good things about it as well. Uh, it definitely a place that I love. I would love to visit one day. I, I definitely have some Venezuelan food for sure. Some <laughs> arepas and stuff. Too. Too. <laughs> so that was a good start. You like yeah, those? absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so tell me, uh, how did you get to your career now? Like, how did yeah. it transition from coming here, learning English and all that, and, and then following your career path? Yeah, so I actually did not, this was completely by chance. I wanted to be a pilot. That's really what I wanted to wow. do. And I wanted to do it for the military. I wanted to be a fighter jet pilot. <laughs> and my problem was that as a freshman, I couldn't take elective courses because all the courses you have to take were like, you know, ESOL classes. You might right. know that. And I told uh, one of my teachers, I was like, I really need to get into Air Force ROTC so I can get the scholarships because you have to do four years, all four years. And so he helped me out and I ended up testing out of the ESOL program. And uh, with that, I was able to get into JROTC and I was good. I mean, Luis, I was made for this. I actually, wow. yeah, I mean, I, I got all the medals. I did, I did all the drill meets. I became the first female Corps commander in my school. So I was on my way, you know, I was like, this wow. is it. Um, and then I graduated, I graduated top honor. Um, but as you know, in Latin American countries, uh, women specifically, they don't leave the house, um, unless they're married. So there's, there's that culture still. I remember my dad saying, you know, you're in America, you're not American. And so that was a very, you know, yeah. So Big distinction. you're not yeah. going to go away to school. You don't, you don't leave at 18. Uh, so that was a limitation. And I was very disappointed because I did get a scholarship to go to uh, Colorado Springs Academy to pursue that career for Air Force, um, but I couldn't pursue it. And so I actually ended up staying, um, in, I got a, other scholarships for local schools in Florida, so Florida-based schools, and I ended up going to a, a local school. And I was like, well, what, you know, since I'm not going to do what I want to do, what's next, you know? Right. And I thought, well, writing is easy for me. I'm just going to get into communications, you know? And it's it's really interesting because never would have imagined, you know, that years from now, a position called storytelling would exist. Like, you don't go to school for storytelling. You don't go to school for social media. Social media didn't exist back then. Right. So, but I got into communications and, 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 you know, one thing linked to the other and with communications field, you can just really expand to other things. And so the rest is history. That's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's like a hidden, um, what are it called? It's like a, a disguised blessing, I guess, to some degree, right? hundred percent. Those twists in life, then you're like, you look there, you're like, what is this? And then you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So yeah, I mean, you gotta trust, you gotta trust the, the journey, I guess. Absolutely. Um, and then speaking of journey, uh, what were some of the things that, that you, you had to overcome, like some of the barriers that you've had? Oh my gosh. Um, where do you start? Right. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I like to speak to, I think some of the ones that I think everybody can relate to. And, uh, the first one really is about not being confident in myself, um, coming from a, a background, like we just spoke about, you know, being an immigrant that you already limit your mind so much. Yeah. Um, you don't, you don't think you can, you know, achieve the American dream. There's so, there's so many different things that you look and you're like, that's not for me. So you don't even look into it. You don't even attempt to uh, achieve it because you don't think it's for you. So that was one of the things that I had to really move away from. Um, I would say culturally, that was a thing also religious wise. Um, there was a moment where I had to really look introspectively and ask myself, am I, you know, am I acting a certain way? Am I going through life a certain way because this is what I am, or this is what I've been taught to be, uh, and really divorce those ideals and go with the ones that served me. So a moment of, of just kind of being reborn and really, uh, thinking about my own core set of values, defining success for myself, uh, you know, as a Latinos, you know, especially as a Latina woman, if you're not 20 and married, you're going to, you know, die an old hag and, and not have, any yeah. kids, you're gonna have a whole bunch of cats. Um, <laughs> so it's removing that, those ideas and going, no, you know, I'm in a new country with new possibilities and I, I can, I can think big, I can dream big. Um, and so that was my struggle. My struggle was to get to the point where I could, I could dream big without limiting myself, um, you know, from those learned behaviors. So. Yeah. That must've been hard. I mean, and I congratulate you for arriving at that point because I feel like a lot of us, unfortunately, myself included, it just kind of lived with the norm of what society expects from you and so on. And, and you're kind of like an autopilot to some degree, you know, so. A hundred percent. And I was there. I mean, for me, you know, I, I thought I was just living the way I was thought to live and that, that was just checking the boxes and I'm like well who who built those boxes and for what like who's, whose idea is this you know and so yeah defining your success is so it's so empowering empowering is because you no, no longer you know conform to those norms if if you success to you looks like having 
five dogs, then go have five dogs and be successful. If it's, it, you know, for women, it's so multifaceted. We can choose to be mothers or not. We can choose to get married or not. Like this, this, you know, even the, the generation, just my mom's generation didn't have that choice, you know, even at yeah. that level. So I had that choice. And so uh, it was breaking uh, generational, um, we call them in Spanish patrones, uh, generational establishments that have yes. been embedded in our, in our, in our society and saying, why? Why do I have to get married and have kids if I don't want to? I mean, if I want to, great. But if I don't, I don't have to. I can get a job and I can do all the things. Yeah, I love that. You know, I was reading one of your quotes on Instagram when you first got your book deal. Yeah. Uh, and it caught my attention. You know, it said, okay. you can be a Christian, you can be a wife, a mom, a sister, a daughter, full-time worker, a student, a friend, a volunteer, a coach, and then published author for you in that case. Um, how do you balance it all? Like. <laughs> What's the secret sauce? You know, um, I, I balance it understanding the currency of time. And I think a lot of people miss that in life. And, and people that get it uh, are those people that are able to really do everything. Uh, these are everybody who decides. It's, it's up to you. It's nobody like this. It's, it's, not, it's not to anybody else, up, but for you to really look at time and go, okay, what am I doing with this? I look at time from an investment perspective. It's not something I waste. It's something I invest in. Mm -hmm. So everything related to my body, my friends, you know, body, spirit, and soul, I should just put it in those three categories. If it's not nurturing any of those three areas, it's not for me. And that really took courage because I was not like this before. I would lie to myself all the time. You know, Amiri, do you work out? Yeah, I work out. I was lying. I looked at my calendar and I looked at my wallet and none of those things were telling me that I was spending time or money into working out. So I was lying mm -hmm. to myself. And like that, there was many other things that I was looking at. I was like, this is not truly who I, I want to be, but I'm not. And so time is really your currency because it never, it, it never comes back. You know, you and I are spending time today. That's it. it will, that time will never come back. So how are we investing these hours? How to balance that is from that perspective. We all get the gift of 24 hours. If we get to wake up the next morning, that's already a gift. How are you going to invest that into those three areas of who you are? Uh, and so that's where everything comes in. And there was a lot of time wasted in my calendar, a lot of Netflix watching in my calendar, a lot of, <laughs> you know, and so I decided, do I want to do that? Or do I want to do the things that and leverage and invest my 24 hours into something that is for me, uh, for myself now and for the future? And so we all have the time. We really do. Nobody does not have the time to do the things that you want. And you can do many things. So. Right. I love that. Uh, time is currency, right? Absolutely. And, you know, um, one thing that highlights uh, what you're saying to me is it, it sounds like you have a core set of values and then you evaluate how your time is going to be spent based on what's important to you, right? That's, and right. That's, that's your filter, right? That's the formula. That's the that's formula. amazing. And that's also people, right? I, I, tiers of people like, okay, if you're top tier, you're getting more of my time. If you're down <laughs> here, you don't get, it's serious. Like I was, you know, I used to go like I, what time it was like one of those moments in life, right? I was at a, I was at a, um, a happy hour and I sat there and I was like many years ago and I was like, why am I here? Like spending time and money with people that I don't, really care about. Like, right. If I die today, I don't care what happens to these people. And they don't care about how, like, why am I here? Do you know? And so I started saying no, lots of no. Oh, Miri, you went, no, thank you. No, 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 no. And empowered myself to just, no, I'm going to be where I want to be with whom I want to be. Um, and, and that's that prioritization of people and, and places and things that we want. Yeah. Do. That is super powerful. It's one of the things that I've been learning to do is how to say no, because sometimes there's a fear of missing out. Right. Yeah. And you know, sometimes even opportunities come your way that that may not necessarily serve a purpose other than money at the time, but it's really not aligned with your values, right? <laughs> it has to be aligned. And if that's your value, then you're not wasting time. You're investing. Right. That's how you got to look at it. If to you is saying, hey, you know what? For me, my goal is by age, whatever, I got to make this amount of money. Then by all means, hustle it up and go to all the happy hours that it takes for you to get right. there. So it's just a different set of values that you have according to your mission. And so they're not right or wrong. They just are how you invest your time to arrive at those, at those. Yeah. Missions. I love that. I love that. So I wanted to go back to uh, talking about failure again, because I think it's uh, very much in line with what we're talking about. So you, you say on your website, I failed frantically. Um, I failed miserably. I failed often. <laughs> And you said that failing taught you everything that you need to know to take you beyond uh, just mere story storytelling, but the, the magical world of story designing, right? So yeah. tell us about how you embrace failure to move you forward. 
you know, I don't think I had a choice. <laughs> you just do and you, that's it. Um, Microsoft is a great company. It's also very competitive. And so, you know, it's uh, they give you a laptop. It's like, go do and make impact tomorrow. And so um, when I got the role as a storyteller years ago and they moved, I actually, and they invited me to go to headquarters. I, I thought I knew what I was getting into. And I was like, okay, I'm a marketer. I'm a communicator. I can tell stories. Like who doesn't know how to tell stories? And then I, that's when I began to fail because I realized, uh oh, I don't know how to tell the kind of stories that they want me to tell. These were stories specific for engineers. I am not an engineer. And this was a very deep technical space. It's the heart of Microsoft. Microsoft wow. IT. And uh, learning another my, language, huh? <laughs> it's, an, it's an entire different world. It's it's language and world. And so um, I came in and I, you know, I was given the space of telling st uh, stories of digital transformation for data, security, and AI. So anything that had to do with those three, you know, um, what we call them function areas at Microsoft, they were the stories that belonged to me. So lots of different stories, lots of different services and conversations. And um, I don't know if you've ever tried to be a journalist with an engineer, but they're not easy to talk to. <laughs> they don't want to tell stories. Um, and so that was the first idea of like, uh oh, my personality is not helping. It's actually making it worse. The way that I'm going about this is not helping. I'm not building trust with this audience. Like all the things fail, 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 fail. And I had to really take a look at myself and go, okay. What am I doing wrong and why? Um, quickly put this ego aside and all the things that I knew and the credentials aside, because that's where it comes from. It's like, oh, I have the credentials. Oh, I have the school. I know how to do it. That didn't matter. Uh, and start from scratch um, and start asking questions that really, you know, with empathy. And um, and that's where I began to really actually understand that empathy is a skill set. It's not only a personality trait. I, I'm not an empath person. Um, that, that's not part of my personality, but you can become one. And I began to talk and think about empathy and learn about empathy years before everybody was talking about it, which is, it's cool now, but it wasn't back then, yeah. especially not in engineering. Um, and, you know, to me it became, I read the book by our CEO, Satya Nadella. He talked about his own, uh, you know, his own personal experience with empathy, becoming an empath. And I got really curious. Um, and I think that was the moment of transitioning of going, okay, failures leading to curiosity to unlearnings, to, you know, moving aside the ego and what I already know and, and really get into this childlike mindset of, I know nothing, teach me something and open up to that world and get curious and ask questions. And I began to ask questions and uh, learned that through the questions, you know, engineers were really, really happy to answer the questions. They wanted to help um, build relationship. And, and that's what started the process of me uh, using empathy as a connected tool um, and becoming an empath. I learned there's three, three levels of empathy. I was way like, <laughs> no idea where to start. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my kids will still call me cold and ruthless. Um, I don't, I don't think I am so bad anymore. I hope I'm not, um, in the trajectory of that, um, failure was just what needed to happen for me to reset myself. Um, and, and it did, I mean, there was no other choice than for me to just take a look and go, okay, what, what is not working? Everything I'm doing doesn't work. Throw it all aside and start something new. Yeah. I'm sure it took a lot to put ego aside. Yes, for sure. <laughs> And, you know, it's unfortunate. I think you, you use the, the words cold and ruthless. And I think it's unfortunate that a lot of women can be called that just having the same traits that a, a male would have. And he might be called driven. And oh, right. Good point. <laughs> that, that is, yes. Yes. A hundred times. Yes. Uh, we do as women uh, have to find that balance uh, all the time. And I think uh, it is unfortunate, but I also, I've learned to embrace it because as I navigated the space, especially being a woman in tech, you know, we only represent 2% of the, of the industry, which is ridiculous. And, you know, this is 2022. Um, I embrace the journey because I know we haven't made it and it's okay. That means that I get to pave the way for my, our daughters and our daughter's daughters. And so mm -hmm. I'm okay with saying, okay, we haven't arrived. We're still navigating this. But if I do something and I stick with it, I know that somebody coming behind me who's just starting, uh, it'll be easier for them. And they will be more, um, you know, it'll be more acceptable that they show up however they show up and they can do that. So I'm, I'm glad to see the evolution in, in my time, right, in, in, in the, you know, 40-something years that I've been on this earth. Yeah. And you've done a lot of work with uh, mentees as well, right? 
Tell me about that. hundred uh, percent. I mentor around 15 women uh, in sessions every six months. I can't oh, wow. say a lot. I know it's a lot already. That is. Um, it is. Um, and there's people waiting all the time. And I'm like, I can't, I would love to want to mentor you right now, but I can't. Um, and I do that because I am passionate about um, women, you know, feeling and learning and loving themselves and going through the, it's a curriculum that I built for them, for me, honestly, um, learn, learn myself, like myself and love myself before any, I do anything else in the world. And that's important because we are all men and women. I know we're all full of so many self-doubt um, and, and things that cripple us at the, at the heart. And so when we learn to truly love ourselves, all the things like time, like prioritization, all of that is part of that process of saying, you know, how am I, what am I doing and why am I doing this and asking yourself that why? Yeah. A lot of soul searching, huh? A lot of soul searching. A whole lot. Yeah. What are some of your daily practices that you, that you do just to kind of stay balanced and focused? Yeah, I begin my day uh, with a gratitude meditation. So I give thanks. Um, definitely give thanks for, I, there's always something to be thankful for, but I try to be very specific as well. So every day changes. I could th be thankful for my family, be thankful for the breath, uh, um, anything that shows up that to me, it's, you know, hearing the bird outside, having the, having hearing to be able to hear mm -hmm. the bird. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, I do work out. I'm not lying anymore. <laughs> your, your calendar in your, in your pocket. I can show you my calendar says that I work out. I work out, um, every day I try to, at least, um, I do rowing. So rowing is, uh, my, my hardcore warm up, oh, and wow. then I get into yoga. Um, and I do a modified yoga with actually with weights, um, that I created myself. I don't know if it's a real a thing, but I do a mix of weight training with yoga at the same wow. time. And, um, yeah, that must be hard. It's hard. So I use the, uh, a balancing, um, ball and I actually get on top of the ball and I do weights on top of it. So you're actually working Whoa. out your core. Yeah. So, but it's fun. It, it's challenging and I, <laughs> I get bored quickly. So it's, this keeps me challenged. So you keep it challenged. Um, so that's my morning routine. And then I spend time with people. So I give myself an hour. Uh, so I wake up early, do my workout. And then the next hour after my workout, my, just kind of my rest period. Um, I actually do, um, I connect with people. I send them notes. This is my top list of priority. Uh, Filling my soul with saying, hey, love you. Just want to say hi. Or, hey, mom, how are you doing? You send you kisses. So my list of people that I rotate every day. So not everybody doesn't get the same message every day. But yeah. um, just keeping in touch and saying, you know, if I died today, did I talk to Miri? Yeah, she sent me a note this morning and she told me how much she like. Nobody will ever guess if I love them. They know I love them because I told them I love them. So I spend time with people first and then I prepare for work. Um, my work prep actually starts on Sunday because I like to prep for my entire week. So I'm not rushing to be like, oh, what's next? So I, I'm pretty much very tight on schedule uh, after I get to work. So when I'm at work, it's just go, 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 go. Yeah, it's business. Wow, that's amazing though. Because it yeah. seems like you, you have a, a really good system to, to keep things out as well, you know? It is, <laughs> There's so many yeah. distractions, right? Throughout the day and yes, things absolutely. wanting your attention and your time. Yeah. And you have to, again, that's part of saying, no, you have to be like, sorry, I can't. And everybody will try. A lot of people will try to take your time. And if you saw it as money, it's like the same thing. If like they're trying to take your money, you're going to say no. Like, so why are you giving away your time to people? No, like be, be, be very protective of that. That, that currency does not come back. Money comes back. That currency doesn't come back. Um, also at night I take time to, uh, unwind, especially spend, spend time with my family. We have a routine at night. Um, uh, my family is very private, my two boys and my husband. And so we, we, you know, we spend time with each other. And then at night I read a book. I, I'm always reading something. I'm not lying about that either anymore. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually, I, I have two books. I typically I'm reading two or three books at a time. So I'll read a couple of pages of each of the books and then I, I turn everything off so I can wind down and I do end with a meditation practice at night. So. Nice. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Very inspiring. Now, speaking of books, tell me about brand storytelling. How did that come about? <laughs> you know, it was not on my list of things to do. I know people sometimes are born like, Oh, I, I want to go write a book. That was not me, believe it or not. I was never thinking if I should go write a book. I was, um, I was in London, uh, speaking about brand storytelling because after I started to fail and I started to gain trust with our engineers, um, I finished my, I was finishing my master's at the time and my capstone project was around using design thinking to, um, create a product. And it occurred to me, well, stories can be products, you know, since I was failing, I'm going like, I got to do something. So I used storytelling as the example and I was hoping that it would work and it worked. 
So I used design thinking principles to design stories. That's when it became before just telling stories, actually designing them using the five uh, design thinking steps. And so that took off like, I mean, overnight, all of a sudden I'm traveling the world, talking to people inside and outside Microsoft about this. And it was overwhelming. I mean, I was, it, I was overwhelmed. It was an instant, like instant fame out of like Microsoft. Like, <laughs> it's going on. It was really, really overwhelming. So I'm, at, I'm in London talking about this thing about how to tell stories with design thinking. And the publisher was there in the crowd and she approached me at the end and she's like, Hey, you know, we really are interested in having you submit this as an idea for a book. And I was like, oh, no, thank you so much. Nice to meet you. I got to go. <laughs> um, and so she, that's saying no, you know, learned this. I was like, absolutely not. Um, and But she pressed on, she pressed for like three months. She was just very adamant. Persistent. And I, yeah. And I was, I was actually, I looked into it because I was like, wow, she really believes in me. Um, and she, she really, what she said to me that really made me change my mind was she's like, hey, Mary, I know that you care about people learning this methodology. If you write a book, you know, instead of you having to travel all over the world, right, you just write the book and people can read it. And so you don't have to like exert yourself and it's, it's immortalizing your content. So I was like, yeah. oh, that makes sense. Um, so I said yes. And, um, but I was so, so much stuff was going on. And so I, I, it was supposed to publish um, in this in summer of 2019. I postponed the date over and over until they said no anymore. They're like, no, we're going to cancel your contract. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll publish something. Um, and so given the dates and all the, all the postponements, it actually ended up publishing and coming out in March, 2020, which wow. is wow. Pandemic. Time. Yeah. The whole world is. I mean, <laughs> and it's funny because I, we had first negotiated that it would come out in December, 2019, which I'm like, Oh great. It's a good day. It's Christmas. People are home. People are reading. They'll buy books for, you know, their friends. It's, you know, it's, season of giving and then they're like no sorry we can't make that work it's going to be march 2020 i'm like what happens in march 2020 well there you go <laughs> now we know <laughs> and it uh it was ridiculous i had a 17 week tour that uh wow. obviously never materialized yeah uh parties everything just all kinds of events uh media events pr events all canceled within you know two days and then i was like i sat at home i was in seattle at the time living in seattle and i was like okay what's next like you know, my, it's not, nothing's going to happen. And the opposite happened. People were home. People were reading. Mm -hmm. People, brands were thinking about empathy. Empathy became a thing all of a sudden. I had been talking about it. So, um, it took off and you know, here we are. That's amazing. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the show notes for where people can get the book. Uh, but can you tell us where is the book available? Yeah. So any retailer, so, uh, you know, make basically Amazon will have it, any other online retailer as well. Uh, the publisher is Kogan page. So if you want to purchase directly from the public publisher, you can go to Kogan page publishing and find it there. Uh, but you can just Google my book brand storytelling, Miri Rodriguez, and you'll, you'll find ways to purchase. Okay. It. And I'll put links to the publisher and all that. And you are about to translate this into Spanish and Russian. Did I hear that right? <laughs> So I'm not. What happens is that the publisher, <laughs> don't believe me, I don't have time. Um, I wish I could actually do the audiobook. They did give me the rights to the audiobook. Uh, I just, it's, it's a lot of commitment right now that I just can't mm. make. But um, the publisher sells the idea to other publishers around the world. And so the other publishers will pick it up. And so it really depends on the, you know, how hungry you, the audience is in that part of the world for something like this. And so the first one was Korean, which I was like, are you kidding me? So wow. uh, Korea bought the, bought the rights and they published in Korean. Russian was the second one. Um, and then I was hoping, and, you know, I was really putting it in the universe for Spanish because of course I am, you know, obviously Latina and uh, Editorial Pan America picked it up in Colombia last year and so they're publishing this year wow so congratulations that's out. amazing so I know it's great and so each publisher will actually do the whole translation all of it themselves they basically own the rights to the content itself. gotcha yeah. so you imagine when you were thinking about becoming a pilot somebody would have told you there, like oh yeah you're gonna end up <laughs> writing a book Look, Luis, you... I'm not gonna lie I still <laughs> dream of being a pilot I think once I retire I'm gonna buy my own fighter jet just for fun and then just fight, you know just go like drop drones yeah the and get a decommissioned <laughs> U.S. Air Force plane right and just, just go for it just for fun just for fun <laughs> um yeah you know I mean we never know why things happen the way they do but I do think 
what's funny is when 9-11 happened, um, I would have been right in, you know, serving like active, uh, you know, on active duty in the Air Force. So who wow. knows? And, you know, yeah, absolutely. And so, um, and I, what I, I wanted to actually, so I wanted to be a, um, a fighter jet pilot also combined with intelligence. So a lot of that, you know, that field would have been front and center of mm-hmm. things like, you know, things like 9-11 and all the war that we had with Iraq. So, you know, God knows, I, I do believe in God. And so God knows our path more than we do. And so um, you got to Yeah, God works in mysterious ways for sure. Sure does. Sure does. You never know. Um, I wanted to ask about your goal to democratize storytelling. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah. So, you know, um, coming from a family of um, speakers and storytellers, my parents both are gifted, gifted um, oratories and they each in their own space, very powerful. And so when you grow up in that arena and you see, I mean, my father, uh, was actually an evangelist and he packed out arenas. They call them the Latin American Billy Graham. Oh, wow. I, I, saw, I know very, very powerful. So I would see him, you know, on stage and just moving crowds and it's almost uh, overshadowing. Like, and, you know, you're sitting there and you watch your, your, your dad, your mom sing. my mom also, she, uh, she wrote several books. She's a singer. And so, so many, so many different th- talents. And so, um, I always thought that these things only belonged to people that had the talent or had the space. Politicians, preachers, um, you know, if you have a title, uh, right. leaders, CEOs. Um, and I learned that that's not true. We all are storytellers, our heart, and we all have that cognitive ability that we can hone into to, to make magic, you know? And so when I learned more about storytelling in my own space and I thought, wow, I'm relearning storytelling um, in the engineering space. If I can do this, not being an engineer, anybody can do this. And I want to let people know and remind people that we all have that superpower inside of us. And so when we look at other people go, of course they can do that because they're a politician. Of course they can do that. That's not true. You and I can do it. We are, we do do that. We're doing it right now. And so uh, democratizing means just reminding people, not teaching them anything new because it's nothing that we don't know how to do. We do it every day, but it's reminding them that we do have that inside us and that we can actually leverage this incredible connectedness uh, tool to talk to each other in a way that really um, enables us to connect at the human level and we can get our point across differently. And so we can pass down ideas and values and stories and, and immortalize ourselves through our stories. Yeah. And and that goes beyond just on the career professional side, right? Like we can use that on, on the, our own personal lives. hundred percent. And that's exactly what that is. It's like, we all often think about business and that's always the mindset, but really it's how to employ this practice for everything, for everyday life, for relationships with our loved ones, for, you know, wh- wherever we want to go next, it doesn't have to be business. It's really a, an all encompassing tool that we can, we can leverage in any aspect of our lives. Yeah. That's so true. Um, it's amazing that you've like been able to think outside the box and, and push beyond your comfort zone to just follow your own path. Right. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So what can you share with women that are listening? Like, how do they basically overcome that internal struggle sometimes, right. To stay within the norm and, uh, what, you know, what can you say just in terms of just female leadership, leadership in general and, and things like that? That's a great question, Luis. I think I think it's asking yourself as a woman, what would scare you more, doing it or not doing it and then regretting it in the end? Mm. And I think for me, that answer was, I don't even know what's on the other side, but I rather do it, whatever that takes, uh, and then regret it. You know, wake up, I'm you know seventy five years old. I'm like, oh, where, where did my life go? Um, and I know there's fears. I don't I don't counter that or, or want to diminish the fears, but um, fear paralyzes us. And so courage is about getting through that fear. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist or you don't have it, but that you make the choice every day to just confront it and, and get to the other side. And I can tell you like, um, you know, every, every time I've made a choice to confront that fear, um, I have been always, um, happy that I made that choice. It's never been, I never regret it making the choice. Um, I've learned all the lessons or I've won all the things. And so there's always something so surprisingly wonderful outside of that, of that zone of that fear zone that we're looking at. And so ask yourself the question as a woman, we are so many things and we define ourselves by so many things. I've also learned that we are everything and we're nothing. I'm a mom, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, and that does not define me either. So, uh, we're everything and we're nothing. And you get to define that as you grow, as you evolve yourself and as, as we develop ourselves as women in society. So 
it's never too late and it's not to start to take that next step. I was, you know, I was judged a lot. I was even by family members and people around me, my network, uh, you know, what not to do and what to do. And I, my, I always asked myself, well, for, first of all, do they pay my bills? The answer was no. So why am I listening? <laughs> you know, I like, <laughs> why do I care? <laughs> um, and second of all, it's, it's my life. You know, they're not going to live that. I, I, when I own it, I own the responsibility of the choices that I'm making. And so, yes, it's my choice. I will own whatever comes out of that. And it has been nothing but wonderful. Uh, Even if it hasn't been, it's taught me something wonderful. So it has been nothing but wonderful. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Like, because sometimes people closest to you, sometimes even they're well-meaning, but they they might, uh, yeah, just tell you things that it's not in line with what you're trying to do or make you feel discouraged. So how do you uh, just protect yourself from feeling discouraged? Uh, in that environment, or even when you fail and people tell you, I told you so, and things like that? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know that I protected myself back then. I was very discouraged at times and I, I was beating myself up, but I think the desire to not be, not get stuck was m- m- more bigger than my own discouragement gotcha. that I received. But as I grew um, and as I evolved, I I think it also comes with age, by the way. I think I've heard a lot of people say, when you turn 40, you just don't care a lot. <laughs> uh, you, stop scary, you, you stop caring about a lot of things when you turn 40, especially people's opinions. But um, the day today, the way I navigate that is I measure that against you know, my own, my own accomplishments. And I go, well, so where are you in your story? And why are you, why do you care about mine? Do you know what I mean? We're all, our journeys, we're not, this is not a competition. Your life journey is, doesn't compete with mine. That's yours. And if this, right, if that, you chose that and I'm happy for you, that's where you are. I will never be happy just doing what you're doing. So let me do what I do and let me go find my own, my own path. And so it's more of a respectful, a respectful approach to people's journeys, honoring their journey, but also saying, please honor mine as well, because I'm honoring yours and I don't judge yours. So let me, let me do mine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the best thing you could do is just compete with yourself, right? Because uh, if you compare yourself to others, especially now, I think it's even worse with social media. It is um, so hard. <laughs> it really is so hard. Yeah, it, it sure is. For women, even I mean, we we are we're fighting a monster. When I was growing up as a girl, you know, the insecurities were you know, the prettiest girl in school or the most popular girl in school and the talented girl in school, you know, now now we were com- you know we're competing with Kim Kardashian. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, she was not in our school, but now she's in our social media. It does like, yeah. you know? So she's now in your it's feed. like we have. <laughs> Crazy. And so we really, I mean, I've really personally had to um, put parameters and, and, and really the way that I look at social media as a technology is like everything else. Technology doesn't make me any different than what I am. It makes me more of who I am. And so I'm going to own it. It doesn't own me. I'm going to tell it how much time I'm going to spend in it, not tell it, you know, not let it infiltrate me, mm-hmm. put, the, put the parameters, put the, um, the, the core values as well. So I have contracts with myself about social media. Uh, I have, you know, boundaries that I don't that I follow that I follow every day. And so that keeps me sane and it keeps me as authentic as I can be in a space like that. So. That's amazing. Um, are you able to share some of those? Is it like a time constraint? Like, okay, I'm, I'm only going to spend X on, on this platform or something like that. Yes, absolutely. So I, um, obviously I do some work for my business, uh, which I typically do early in the morning. Um, and so I, I put up block time for that before I get into my Microsoft work and Microsoft hours. Um, and then at night I give myself what I call happy hour, which is, <laughs> <laughs> it's my happy hour. It does not involve drinking. Um, but it's basically just, um, connecting on social media, especially on TikTok and just getting my, you know, all the, all the happiness, uh, things happening on social media. I do not watch the news. Uh, I try not to, I try to stay away from the news on social media. Um, sometimes I'll, sometimes I will, but most of the time I won't. Um, so yeah, it's very prescripted. I, I know where I'm going and I, I, you know, I, I don't step away from the space that I've created for myself. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Um, I did that once. Uh, I still, I'm kind of doing it where I'm not really reading the news Except for I just you know the major stuff you're gonna find out sure, anyway. Sure, exactly. Because it seems to be so negative all the time, right? So 
the stuff that sells and, and clicks <laughs> is like what attracts. I mean, it, it's known to be addictive to the brain. We have a negativity bias, negativity bias, right? So neuroplasticity is a, a practice where you actually train your brain to not be negative. And so those are the kind of things that you have to work on. It's not allowing the neg- negative stuff to continue filling your mind uh, so you can train your brain actually to be happy. And so that's part of it. You know, you have to, you have to create boundaries to make sure that you're not being influenced negatively. Yeah. That is so, so huge. I love that. Um, I know that you're super busy and gearing up for another trip. So I wanted to ask you one more thing. Yeah. Usually, uh, this is a pretty quick question is imagine you were on an elevator and it's going to be like a 30 second ride you with a complete stranger it happens to be a young woman and okay. you're never going to see her again. All right. Yeah. She doesn't know you. She doesn't know about your book. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so what can you share? Or what would you share in those 30 seconds about, you know, speaking about two women in general, uh, yeah. what can they do to find the courage to chase their dreams? Uh, or what can they do when they're facing daunting challenges? Yeah. So I would say actually just with one, with one answer, um, dare to tell your story and build your platform with that story, because if you don't, somebody else will. Um, and that, that's it. And just there to tell your story, you choose it. It's your, it's your story. It's your life. And, and, and if you don't do that, then you're relinquishing that right to someone else, um, your voice to someone else. Um, for me, when I, when I took, you know, charge over my personal story, um, I began to empower myself and give myself the voice and the platform that I wanted. I was not letting anyone or anything do that for me. And that's empowering. That's, that's, it's what I will be known for. It's my, I decided to tell my story. Imagine if all of us during, you know, COVID-19, March, 2020, imagine if all of us started to write a daily diary of what we were going through. Imagine that, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this, this moment in time will go down in history. Our children's and our children, children will read about this in history books, but it will be historians who will write the book and they will miss the real stories. They will miss what really happened because it's it's with their biases. It's with their own lived experiences. Imagine if all of us, all, all billion of us would have written what really happened. The story would be much different. That's the power of storytelling. And so what we each have power to tell our own story. We each have our story and the power to tell our own story. So never relinquish that right. And and that empowers you to also take control of the rest, the next chapters of your story. Nobody will write them but you. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. It's uh, quite the the mind shift. It's like, you're, if you don't do it, you're giving away that power. So find your own voice and tell your own story. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for asking. It's a great question. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So where can we find you on social media, uh, online? Uh, anything you'd like to share as far as like uh, social media handles or websites? Absolutely. So uh, definitely on LinkedIn, Miri, M-I-R-I, Rodriguez. Uh, just look at my profile there. Um, um, on Twitter, I'm, it's more of a techie audience that I serve there. Uh, so it's at Miri Rod on Twitter. On Instagram, I'm going to warn everybody, this page is dedicated to my girls in tech. So I'm more of <laughs> queendom. I'm more of girl empowerment there. If you want to follow, that's great. But I'm, uh, that's I, that's who I serve there. If you like the content, by, by all means. But it's really true truly about women empowerment. And I show up on all the facets of who I am. I'm, I'm very uninhibited there because I think that's, I'm modeling that for women to be. And so you'll, you'll see that all of the three spaces um, are all me. None of them are different. The content might be a little bit different, obviously because of the platforms, but um, definitely um, Instagram at Miri Rod, Twitter at Miri Rod and LinkedIn and my website, Miri Rod.com. I'm actually getting ready to launch a new brand um, called be mindful, be happy. And so um Along with the new brand, I'm also revamp, re, um, uh, revamping my website, which is coming up in March. So I'm excited. That's I'm awesome. Excited. Yeah. I'm really Tell excited. us about the brand, Be Mindful, Be Happy. Be Mindful, Be Happy. Uh, it was <laughs> last year I went through a medical journey. I was uh, diagnosed with BRCA type 1, which is an inherited harmful gene that exposes me to reproductive system cancers. So uh, immediately I had to undergo four treatments, four surgeries, um, oh, wow. which included a, yeah, a lumpectomy, a hysterectomy, a biopsy, and reconstruction. And I'm actually undergoing two more in July, which is a, a total mastectomy and the final reconstruction. And so Wow. During that time, I was out of work, obviously on a leave for six months. And I was thinking, what's next? You know, I was, uh, I was like, what, what do I want to go next? 
if I don't come back to Microsoft, what would that look like? Um, and I was looking at companies um, that were out there that were being sold e business. And this one called Be Mindful, Be Happy is everything that I had envisioned my brand to be. Uh, it's a, a it's an accessories, a wellness accessories shop, but also serves as um, a meditation and wellness guide. So I'm actually partnering with three women that I know personally that have helped me in my journey. So actually friends of mine that are uh, coaches, life coaches, trauma coaches. Um, and so you get to connect with people in that community-based area um, where you can actually ask questions. We'll have content, we'll have blogs, and we also sell accessories for meditation. Uh, so it's an all-up wellness shop uh, for people that are interested in learning more about meditation, yoga, um, and just the body, spirit, and soul. Got it. That's amazing. Uh, so will there be a community aspect to it as well? They will be. Yeah. So that will be part two. We're launching the website itself uh, at the end of March, and then we will build a, a community. It's going to be an exclusive community. So you have to be a member uh, to be able to really, so we do give free content. Of course, we want to share, you know, we want to help everybody, uh, but the community piece will actually be exclusive to people who need, want to, you know, connect with people and with, with um, people like me, basically people like you who have found something that enables them to, you know, do a side hustle or to, be happy in some way. Where, what is your happiness? What is your happiness tool? And so talk about that and talk about wellness, um, really get deep into the spirit and the soul part of us. That's amazing. Yeah. Yet another chapter, huh? <laughs> yes, I know. I can't wait. I'm really excited for that. You're the first one who actually hears about this. So this is an exclusive. I don't know when this is going oh, on. Look at that. I'm telling you, I'm telling your audience first. Look at that. <laughs> I am honored. Well, you, you heard it here first, everyone. Check That's out the, right. <laughs> the links. Uh, so I put in the show notes, you have a link to Mary's webpage and also LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and the publisher's website. So you can look at her book, Brand Storytelling. Thank you very much, Mary, for being on the show. Um, I look forward to just seeing how your new venture develops. And congratulations. Thank you for sharing your story. And it's just super insightful and empowering to myself. And I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will find it as well. So thank you so much. Louis, thank you. The pleasure is mine. I appreciate what you're doing for women in this month and what you're doing for the community in general, telling stories and creating a platform uh, for people to share the stories to inspire your audience. So thank you so much. And I wish you the best of luck. I'm glad we're connected. Thank you for reaching out. Um, and, you know, whatever I can do to continue empowering uh, people in your space and however I can help you personally, please let me know. I will. Absolutely. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, just send me an email, Luis at omawidowealth.com. And I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to On My Way to Wealth. If you have any questions, please send me an email at louise at onmywaytowealth.com. The information provided here is for information and education purposes only. The opinions expressed herein are solely those of myself, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources and no representations are made by my firm or myself about other parties' information or accuracy or completeness. All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with a financial advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation. Thank you.